I'm Janine Herbst with these headlines. In Nashville, police say the suspect in the RV explosion Friday morning died in the blast. But they say it's too early to say what 63-year-old Anthony Warner's motive was. The blast injured three people and left more than 40 businesses damaged. In Illinois, authorities say a U.S. Army Special Forces sergeant based in Florida has now been charged in the deaths of three people in an apparently random shooting at an Illinois bowling alley. Three others were injured. And the death toll from a power a powerful cyclone that battered the Pacific Island nation of Fiji last week has risen to at least four. One person remains missing. Thousands are in evacuation centers. Australia is sending its largest warship along with 600 troops to assist in the rescue efforts. I'm Janine Herbst, NBR News. Help has run out for the millions of Americans who have been relying on federal unemployment assistance during this pandemic. Without President Trump's signature on a recently passed $900 billion relief package, there's no help in sight for people who were relying on this benefit program. The bill, as we'll discuss in a moment, was passed on Friday, but President Trump has yet to to sign it. He's called it, quote, a disgrace, criticizing the package's $600 direct relief payment, saying they should be up to $2,000. So as negotiations stall, two kinds of temporary expanded unemployment benefits expired yesterday. We spoke to someone who's been relying on that money. It's been really stressful and really taking a toll on on me. There's good days and then there's bad days. That's Sharissa Ward. She was furloughed from her job as a server at Disney World in Orlando in April, along with thousands of other park employees. She'd been a server there for 15 years. Feeling that security blanket is ripped from you, that you have that job that you knew that you could rely on, and it's not there anymore. It takes a lot out of you. And then you have, I have three kids that I have to try to not make it seem stressful for while I'm at the same time juggling that. By fall, Ward had exhausted unemployment benefits available from the state of Florida and filed for federal pandemic emergency unemployment compensation, one of two programs that expired last night. She was using the $275 weekly payments to cover necessities for her and her family. Car payment, insurance, utilities, um, just basic needs, you know, basic bills. And then you have to tap into savings to compensate for whatever that doesn't cover. Ward has been trying to make ends meet any way she can, including selling baked goods and crafts to friends and neighbors. Without federal employment payments, she and her kids are now entirely dependent on her partner, who started a small business right before the pandemic. He has a, a job that he works from home, it's kind of been helping, you know, cover some of the things that, you know, I, I used to cover. But again, it's a very unstable market to know how long that is going to last. And while Ward waits for a new relief package to be signed, she says she's trying to focus on being grateful this holiday season. You know, I'm blessed for what I have and what I can do. But there is people living in their cars. There's people that have had to move out of their houses and they've given up everything because they can't afford to live. And it's heartbreaking to know that this is what happens when you don't, you know, have that money coming in. That's Sharissa Ward in Orlando, Florida. She was one of the millions of Americans receiving pandemic unemployment benefits. For Willie Solis, many days start like this in his driveway in Denton, Texas. It's around 9.54 in the morning. Just came out to my car, going to jump on the ship app to see if I can't find a couple of orders. He recorded the sounds of a typical day as a shopper for Shipped, the delivery service owned by Target. He gathers products on store shelves and drives them to customers' homes. Solis was attracted to gig work by the promise of flexibility and controlling his own time. Then Shipped changed the way it calculates pay. That was the last straw for Solis, who had been discussing his frustrations with other shipped workers, known as shoppers, for months. In a two-week period, I talked to over 600 shoppers, and, I mean, I was tearing up. And then next thing I know, I'm 
I'm finding myself talking to national media. The pandemic made things even worse. The workers struggled to get protective equipment like masks and gloves. Solis was on his phone morning and night, connecting with workers on Facebook groups and messaging apps. Soon he was in touch with thousands of people. They organized walkouts, refusing to accept orders. A few protested outside Target's headquarters in Minneapolis. No one was more surprised by this newfound activism than Solis himself. It's taken me to a place where I never thought that I'd be. Um, I'm an introvert, uh, extreme introvert by by natural, <laughs> or my, that's my nature, is very, very introvert. Organizing is now a huge part of Solis's life. He does it while waiting for orders to show up on the app. I responded to several, several people, responded to a couple of tweets, um, responded to a couple of Facebook messages, you know, just try to make, make it a productive morning um, since I'm not seeming to get any orders. He even caught COVID, and he still kept going. I continue to organize from, from the bed, and so <laughs> I know that that sounds crazy, but that's what I did, and um, talking to reporters and doing the things that I was doing to try and get our word out while still working on trying to recover from COVID. It, was, it wasn't fun. His organizing has forced change, getting shipped to acknowledge some workers were not getting the tips they had earned, and the company then made them whole. But Solis says the work is hard. He waits a long time to get orders, since so many people affected by the pandemic have signed up for gig work to make ends meet. And the pay is low. The reality is that I could go out and find another job and, 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 and bring myself up into a better financial situation for me personally. However, we need people to be speaking out. And there's so many people that cannot speak out and they're afraid to speak out. You know, I decided to go ahead and, and, and stick it out as long as I possibly can. So today, that means taking precautions. Solis doesn't want to relive his battle with COVID or spread it to others. As soon as I get to my car, I will um, put some more hand sanitizer on my hands. He says he's learned to live with the trade-offs, like only working enough to cover essential bills and a low-key Christmas with his kids, because he has a bigger mission. It's beyond a one person and one family. It's, it's like my story is everybody's story. Um, and there's thousands of people that, that I speak for. In 2020, Solis found his voice. Nashville has come together time and again in 2020. Residents cleared debris after deadly tornadoes in March. Thousands protest systemic racism this summer. And local researchers have helped with the race to create a vaccine for COVID-19, which has hit the area hard. But it was eerily quiet on Christmas Day. A massive explosion marked another grim moment in what Mayor John Cooper is calling Nashville's hardest year ever. We've persevered and overcome, and I want to take to 2021 the knowledge that we can work together as a city. And After then Friday's on explosion on 2nd Avenue, business owners, tourists, and residents struggled to make sense of what had happened. I was very scared because I Christian Sadala lives around the corner from the blast site. The 22-year-old moved here this year to be in the heart of the city. Now, he's not sure if he wants to stay. If the police have some, you know, answers for us, then yes. And if they keep having police around for a while. But if they don't find anything, then no, I will not be comfortable living here because... Craig Knapp you know, is trying to stay optimistic. He's the general manager of a restaurant about a block away that just reopened with COVID-19 protocols. Knapp says his business wasn't damaged, but it will suffer if the streets stay closed. You just don't know what's going to come at you and what's going to be next, but we'll get through it. Once the crime scene is cleared, Nashville's mayor has pledged to rebuild. He says it's just another test for a city that will come together once again. For NPR News, I'm Samantha Max in Nashville. Soul is a movie that accomplishes quite a lot. It's an emotional tribute to the inspiring power of music, especially jazz. It's also a creative, often playful take on the afterlife, with human souls depicted as cute, powder blue dollops of energy. And it's a wonderful vehicle for star Jamie Foxx, who voices frustrated jazz pianist Joe Gardner. He works as a middle school music teacher, listening to performances like this.
So you can imagine he's less than thrilled when the principal offers him a full-time teaching job. Joe just wants to get lost in the music, which he illustrates by telling his class a little story. I remember one time my dad took me to this jazz club, and that's the last place I wanted to be. But then I see this guy, and he's playing his chords with force on it. And then with a minor, I went, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I wanted to learn how to talk like that. Connie knows what I mean. Right, Connie? I'm 12. That's often how Soul tells its story, following poignant, revelatory moments with a quick joke to keep things from getting too heavy. Which is important, because not too long after scoring a gig as the pianist for a famous jazz artist... Yes! Joe falls down a manhole and finds himself stuck in the afterlife, on a conveyor belt stretching towards a blinding white light. Joe tells the other souls next to him he's got other plans. No, 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 no. Listen, I have a gig tonight. I can't die now. <laughs> well, I really don't think you have a lot to say about this. Yes, yes, I do. I don't think you're supposed to go that way. This can't happen. I'm not dying today. Not when my life just started. This may not sound like the setup to a heartwarming story, but keep watching, because soul may surprise you with how its delightfully odd messages on finding your life's purpose translate into an enjoyable, sometimes rollicking tale. The animation here, especially of the musicians, is detailed and elegant. Joe's playing is modeled on the nimble fingers and physicality of jazz star John Baptiste. Joe loses himself in playing, he's surrounded by swirling lights and pulsing colors, a perfect depiction of the moment when a musician connects with their instrument and everything else falls away. But most importantly, Joe is Pixar's first black lead character. Watching his journey, you can see that the production team took pains to create authentic looking black characters while avoiding typical animation stereotypes. When Joe is mistaken for a mentor in the afterlife, he's paired with a young soul named 22, played by Tina Fey. 22 so resists going to Earth, she's angered some pretty well-known mentors, as she happily explains. I've had thousands of mentors who failed and now hate me. Mother Teresa. I have compassion for every soul. Except you, I don't like you. Copernicus. The world doesn't revolve around you, 22. Muhammad Ali. You are the greatest pain in the butt. When these two team up to get Joe's soul back into his body, the story really takes off. At the end of a very tough year, Soul provides the perfect palate cleanser, a story filled with music and sly humor based on the idea that devotion to what you think is your life's purpose doesn't matter much if you don't find time to live a little while pursuing it. I'm Eric Deggins. The facility is called Arbor Terrace at Cascade, and it's managed by the Arbor Company. By now, many of its other Georgia locations have had COVID cases and deaths, but nothing like what happened at Cascade. There, 54 residents and 36 staff members caught the virus. That's not the only difference, though, between this facility and the rest. Arbor Terrace at Cascade is also the company's only facility in Georgia in a black neighborhood which, to some of the families, just doesn't seem like a coincidence. Their brand has definitely been tarnished, but it doesn't appear it's going to be tarnished in the white areas. It makes you really wonder that. I mean, I would drive by there and just to look and see what was going on. I'm still trying to put it together. How did that happen? That was Trisha Johnson, Cedric Hendricks, and Judith Hatch. They're all children of residents who died or contracted the virus. The outbreak at Arbor Terrace at Cascade is part of a grim pattern we've seen playing out all over the country. Black people are getting and dying from COVID-19 at higher rates than white people. And to understand how it happened here, it helps to understand a bit about this area of Southwest Atlanta, which is called Cascade. That's Hoosier Memorial United Methodist Church on a Sunday a few months before the pandemic. Ernestine Mann was there most Sundays. She was always smiling. She was just an open person. She loved people, and everybody here was Miss Ernestine Mann's friend. Pastor Gary Dean says the congregation there mirrors the community, which is older and almost entirely black. 
Over the years, the late Congressman John Lewis lived in Cascade. So did several former Atlanta mayors. But until about the mid-1960s, much of the area was white. It was one of those white flight things where the blacks were moving into the area more and more. And the, uh, of course, the whites, they, they left and the community became basically all black. Living in Cascade became a badge of honor in the black community. And when Arbor Terrace opened there in 1999, it became a kind of status symbol, too. Ernestine Mann moved there in August of 2019. It was looked upon as one of the creme de la creme um, assisted living facilities. Her daughter, Carla McKinney, says she fit right in. She wasn't the resident that just kind of showed up for the dining hall and then just stayed in her room. She was not just over there wasting away. March 25th was the last day that McKinney and her brother Bill Mann were able to see Ernestine alive. The facility had restricted all visitors a few weeks earlier, so the family had come for a window visit. We could see her coming across the um, lobby, and she was toddling like a baby just beginning to walk. They knew then that something was off. She was able to talk, but see, if you know her, my mom spoke, she spoke strong. This particular time, she sounded extremely weak. It was almost to a whisper. Their mom seemed dazed. Her eyes were darting around. She had trouble recognizing her granddaughter. We ended up not staying as long as we thought we might have because she clearly was tired and something wasn't right. And um, when we did get ready to go, she stood up and she stumbled. McKinney called afterward to have someone check on her mom. The staff agreed that something was wrong. They called an ambulance. And then once she got to the hospital, you know, we blowing up the hospital trying to find out what is going on. Ernestine's coronavirus test came back positive on March 27th. She was placed on oxygen. By March 29th, she had taken a turn for the worse. That day, Bill Mann and McKinney talked to their mom on the phone. I still try very hard to get the sound of her voice out of my mind, even to this day. My mom was crying out for help. She says, come help me, help me, help me, you all. Please come help me. The family couldn't come visit because of coronavirus restrictions. To hear her crying out for help, to know that I couldn't get there, just that desperation that she seemed to be having at that moment, it's hard, it's hard. Ernestine died that afternoon. She was 84. And I understand we're all on the clock, and sooner or later we have to go, but not like that. She didn't have to go this way. Ernestine's death was the first in a wave of at least 16 others at the facility. Four families, including Ernestine's, have filed lawsuits against the company, which denies any wrongdoing. In an email to Cascade Families on April 17th, the president of the company, Judd Harper, wrote, quote, Many of you have asked why Arbor Terrace Cascade experienced these results. We wish we could tell you. Our protocols and processes are exactly the same in all of our senior living communities. To be sure, some of the outbreak at Arbor Terrace at Cascade can be chalked up to bad luck. The company did have infection control policies in place before the pandemic. But there were other factors that made this place vulnerable. In early March, Cascade employees like Jasmine Higgins, a resident assistant, were beginning to feel nervous. Are there going to be any masks? Are there going to be more gloves? Will we have this protection? Because these are things that they're saying that we need. State records say that even by March 27th, when the outbreak had already begun, the facility did not have enough masks, other personal protective equipment, or hand sanitizer. The company denies that it didn't have enough PPE. But by then, it was already too late. Fifteen staff members were reporting influenza-like symptoms, according to those records. Higgins woke up exhausted on a Friday in late March. Later that weekend, she knew she was sick with something. She asked her supervisor what she should do. The response? Tough it out. I was like, y'all told me not to come into work, and I'm telling you that I'm sick, so what do you want me to do? And they were like, you have to come in. In a statement to NPR, the company said staff were always instructed not to work when sick. It was like they were telling us one thing, but then they really meant like it doesn't actually matter. We just have to tell you this. Assisted living facilities in general are vulnerable to infectious disease. Today, nearly 40 percent of all U.S. COVID-19 deaths have happened at these types of facilities. 
African Americans have higher rates of diabetes, high blood pressure, and heart disease. Those are all risk factors for COVID-19. That meant that once the virus got inside, the residents at Cascade might have been hit harder. Location matters too. A facility surrounded by more COVID-19 cases is more vulnerable, and the neighborhoods around Cascade had a lot of cases early on. That's a pattern across the country. A study last summer found Black neighborhoods, regardless of income, had more COVID-19 cases in the early months of the pandemic. Racism transcends class. Middle-class Black neighborhoods are treated differently than middle-class white neighborhoods. That's Andre Perry, a fellow at the Brookings Institution. Many Black neighborhoods simply have less community wealth. And near Cascade, even though the median income is about the same as Atlanta's, the median home value is roughly $100,000 less. Wealth matters when bad times come. And we know that wealth is a protector of sorts, that when we have these economic or health crises, wealth enables us to shelter more, and that difference can mean life or death. The Arbor Company told NPR that each community has its own budget and that funds are not shared across facilities. Marcus Davis, a former maintenance director at Cascade, said Cascade always seemed to be short on money. Davis remembers a company-wide event a few years ago. The other locations showed up in nice, newer vans. We pulled up, and this van was, like, dilapidated on the side. It had all the tears of Cascade, but it had bubbles uh, where the paint was peeling off. When it rained, the water came inside. Like, it was, it was a bucket. Davis says they'd been asking to get the van fixed for years. Later, the Arbor Company did purchase them a new van. In 2017, when Hurricane Irma was coming toward Georgia, he says they asked the company for a generator. We've asked for that several times throughout our budgeting, and the answer was always no, you don't need one. He says Cascade's power went out for two days. The staff bought glow sticks to put around residents' necks. Eventually, he says the corporate office got them a portable generator. These might sound small compared to the pandemic, but Davis says... If you're always shortchanging something, if you're always the last to be a part of something, you can't help but to fail. In April, Ernestine Mann's family held a graveside service for her. The funeral took place on a bright, sunny day. Ernestine's family stood by her coffin under a green tent. They passed out white roses. Pastor Gary Dean gave a short sermon. So far, he's led 10 funerals for people who have died from the virus. They've all been small. I just feel so bad for all of them because you can't celebrate their life the way it needs to be. The gathering was mostly family. A few dozen other people still came. They stood at a distance among the graves or by their cars. My silent McKinney's husband, Jeff, sang a hymn. Somehow he In normal times, Ernestine's funeral would have been standing room only, with family and friends, her sorority sisters, and the many students she taught across three decades. That day, at least one former student was there, The Undertaker, representing the many other lives Ernestine had touched. 